Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we just want to say welcome. You're about to hear an incredible message from our senior pastor, Chad Braswell. But before that, I want to encourage you, if you're watching online, please like, comment, and share this video so others can watch as well. Thank you again for being with us today. We hope you enjoy this message. How are you, Metro Church? You doing well? I'm a little hot up here for you guys at the soundboard, just so that you're aware. I don't want to overwhelm these people with my studio voice. No, it's okay. You doing well over here? How about this section? You doing okay over here? All right. I I think we're going to have to start considering more chairs. This is a good thing, isn't it? The church is back. We're back. Yes. You know, I'm really excited about what God's going to do today. You know, I believe that we've got uh, very exciting stuff that we're going to be digging through today, but we're going to jump into the word and then, uh, or into prayer, and then we'll jump into the word. Is that okay? I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? Father, we're thankful for who you are and what you're doing, God. We are believing for amazing things today because whenever we show up in your house where you are, Lord God, we know that you will turn things right side up in our life. We pray for transformation and change through the application of your word. Holy Spirit, move. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, some of you will remember that uh, a few weeks back I, I taught a message on why church and is church really important and what what scriptures tell us that we have to do church and I really dug through it I helped us understand that you know someone says well church is just man's idea I said yeah the man Jesus Christ and he's the one that we should be following anyway so when we say it's man's idea it's not man's idea it's God's idea. And so uh, I know it seems as though I'm preaching to the choir because so many of you are already tuning in. You're here in the building. But I, I do want you to understand that church is something God loves. And here, he loves it warts and all. What does that mean? He knows he has empowered humans of a fallen nature to continue to run after him and lead as well as possible. How many know excellence is a good thing? How many know perfection is not per possible in this side of heaven? Hello? Right? And so, but what I love is that God, church was his idea. And so I'm shifting away from why church. We know church is God's idea, but today we're going to be talking about which church. Does it matter which church I go to? How do I choose a church? And I know you're like, well, Pat and Chad, I'm already sitting in your church. You don't need to teach me this. No, the reality is this goes beyond these four walls. For those that aren't aware, we've actually seen God give incredible favor with our stream, and we're streaming in over 180 different countries throughout Asia and Europe. We're continually seeing... Uh, just this past month, we were getting a weekly number of 1.6 million people tuning into this. And so I can tell you, God can use the same way he used a little old manger somewhere in the back somewhere. He can use a little old church somewhere in Metro West. You getting that? He will carry his message because he's God. And so what I want to do, though, is I want to empower you to understand how to help your friends choose a healthy church how to help you understand what a healthy church looks like. And if you're hearing this uh, for the first time, maybe you're listening to it later on a podcast, there are traits of a healthy church that you can identify. Are you ready to dig in with me, church? So, you know, there are seven traits. There are, there are more than seven, but I don't have time for more than seven. And you know I struggle with having time for seven. So that's what we're going to do today. But there are seven traits I do want to talk to you about a healthy church. And so there, these indicators will help you identify a healthy spiritual home. Are you ready for them? I got to dive right into you today, church. Uh, we got to give pumpkins away later, don't we? Seven traits of a healthy church. Number one, is it Christ-centered? Is it Christ-centered? Look, we are not trying to build a uh, social club. We're not trying to build a community club. We're not trying to just build a place where we can have potluck dinners. They still do that after pandemic? I don't know. But either way, we're not just trying to build a group of people that enjoy doing life together. That's a byproduct of what Christ called us to do in unity. Right? The church has to be so much more than just like, hey, do they think like I think? It's, hey, are we trying to think like Christ thinks? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> if Jesus isn't exalted, find the nearest exit. I'm going to say it again. If Jesus isn't exalted, find the nearest exit. When's the last time you heard 
somebody in the church talk about Christ? When's the last time he was lifted up in praise and worship? When's the last, last time we prayed to him with faith, believing through Jesus' name something's going to change? It's got to be Christ-centered. And so uh, we've got to get uh, understand that Jesus is not made equal with any other human. God does not share his glory or place of honor with other characters in the Bible. Okay. He's made it very clear. He even said, I am a jealous God. That's in the scripture. So he's not going to share that place of honor. So it's not enough to be a part of a church that encourages you to live better or get beyond bad habits. It needs to be a church that unashamedly teaches Jesus Christ as Savior. Are you getting this? <clears throat> so the scripture tells us the only way to enter the kingdom of God is through the door of his son, Jesus. Look what it says in John 14. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? What did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one gets to God except through me. How many know on the other side of this life, we're hoping to get to the Father? How many people have ever had a dream, hoping, believing, one day you're going to make it to heaven? If you haven't considered it, this would be the day. <laughs> we want to make sure that we're going to get to the Father. We want to go to the one that created all things and live in a peace, in a life here, uh, thereafter that is good. Well, Jesus says, well, I'm the only door. I'm the only door, right? And so no one comes to the Father except through me. The second thing that we've got to think, not just is it Christ-centered, number two is their transformative teaching. Look, we can say Jesus is good, but is his goodness changing our life? You know, someone says, well, I just got to believe in Jesus, right? Well, that's the start, but even demons believe in Jesus. And they tremble at the thoughts. See, Jesus in our world should change how we live in the world. And you know what's really funny about the way God chose to do church, the way God chose to bring salvation to people? It was through this, this communication, this technique through bringing the gospel, the preaching of the word. And it's so crazy because it's as, it's as unplugged and as simple as you can get. He's like, you know what? I got to make this thing so simple. Anyone can do it anywhere. They just got to stir some faith. And so what I love about it is God uses transformative teaching to help you renew your mind. He, through the preaching of the gospel, the Holy Spirit brings conviction and empowers you to create change. Is someone excited about that? The change isn't just on you. It's that the Holy Spirit is going to work through you to bring about a better you. That's a good news. It's transformative teaching. Is there transformative teaching in the church? Where you go, where you're going right now, a lot of people are listening to this. A lot of people, maybe the reason they're consistently online with us is because they haven't found that church near them that is Christ-centered or transformative teaching. I don't shun everybody that's online. I'm thankful they're connected to the healthy body. Right? Hey, I love you. If you're close, we'd love you in here. But if you're not close to a good church, stay connected. Right? Isn't that right? I'm talking to you. That's good. And so is it transformative? Look at Acts 14. It says, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lysteria, uh, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. They were helping with transformative teaching, right? We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. See, there was transformative teaching. There wasn't just a belief and then we're just going to sit down and wait for Jesus. A lot of times people go, awesome, I'm going to get in to heaven because I believe in Jesus. It's like, but God created you to create transformation here, but he can't help you transform your world if you're not being transformed by the renewing of your minds. <laughs> right? It needs to be scripture rich. Anyone that's been in this church for any period of time knows that I I read a lot of scripture. 
The more scripture I read, the more obvious guardrails there are to the word. I allow the word to speak for itself. It's really important. Are you getting this? Mm. This is good. Good job, Patachat. <laughs> is it both encouraging and challenging? It should be transformative for your daily life, encouraging you to love and serve others, not just yourself. Yes? 1 Thessalonians 5 says, And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. How many know patience is going to be something you're going to need if you're going to be about God's business? Patience is, uh, my wife is the most patient person I've ever met, and it's obvious reasons why. She deals with me. But the reality is, even the way she works with our kids, it continually reminds me of the traits and the fruits of the Spirit. I'm like, man, I need to do better at that because that is not a natural gifting of mine, and I need to work on that because you know how many times I, I, I want to bless people with a brick rather than pray for them to change? It's confession time, church. It's confession time. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're being honest. Like, I don't think I can have a pastor that likes... No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> Church is not just a place to feel better, but a launch pad to be better. We need to help bring about the change. Look, at if there's one thing I've learned over the 20 years I've been on staff as a pastor here at Metro Church is people do not change unless God's involved. There can be no true change. There can be a shift for a while, but if it's going to be a life-altering change forever, it's going to have to be something that was plucked at the root, which the Holy Spirit has to be involved with. Are you hearing this? <clears throat> I was recently talking with somebody who's going through a lot of problems, and a lot of them are self-inflicted, which we can all understand, right? And I was helping them understand, if you don't just see this, if you see this thing just for this problem, rather than these problems that got you here, if you don't uproot all of those from the source, all it's going to do five years from now is regrow again, because you just ripped it from the topsoil. You didn't dig deep enough and allow the Holy Spirit to transform you from where it matters. Well, how's your bedrock look? Are you seeing? You seeing what I'm saying? So church isn't just a place to feel better, but it's a launch pad to be better. You ready for number three? Are they mission-minded? Are they mission-minded? Are they outwardly compassionate? Do they truly care about the world, or is it just hunkering down until the end? You know, the fact is, we should be caring about our neighbor. Who's our neighbor? Remember we talked about the Good Samaritan and we've got to stop trying to qualify the boundaries. We need to love people, but not love them and affirm their sin. Love them beyond their sin to see them come to the sun. <clears throat> what does that mean? What it means is I am not in the, the accounting department of heaven. I am not the judge, right? That means I'm in the sales department of heaven. I'm to show the love of Jesus that makes people want to know more about him. And so as long as I'm going to continually be compassionate to others, remembering that other than grace, there go I. But for the grace of God, there go I, right? Whatever they may be dealing with, I could have been there if it wasn't for Jesus. So I'm going to love them through that situation. I'm not going to affirm it. I'm not going to raise banners to support the sin that they're in. I'm not going to go with the culture. I'm going to stand counter to the culture, stand on the word of God, and love people to Christ. <clears throat> but are we outwardly compassionate? It says in Acts 14, back to that scripture, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. In that city. And then they went to the next city. And they went to the next city. The scripture talks about how it's about not just uh, Judea uh, or Jerusalem, but also Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Are we thinking outside of where we are? Are we thinking past lunch even? Someone's like, ooh, lunch. No, are we thinking about others? Luke, so, so look at this. If a church is not seeing new people, if they're not seeing new decisions, if they're not seeing recommitments to Christ, then they're in need of a redirection. So Jesus came to seek and save the lost, not just swap fish in aquariums. So a lot of the church growth that we talk about these days is people leaving one church and coming to another church. And the church goes, we're growing. No, everyone's still dying. We're just swapping where believers are. 
The way we grow is when we see neighbors come to Christ. We, when we see those that are far from Christ return. Are you getting this, church? And so, so it's, it says in Luke 19, Jesus said, for the Son of Man, capital M, meaning he is talking about himself, who is also what? God, capital M, right? For the Son of Man, basically the Son of uh, God, Jesus, is what? He came to seek and save the lost. If Jesus was about seeking and, the save the seeking and saving the lost, and then he told us to go and do likewise, how are we doing? How are we doing? You know, I was, uh, my wife and I were um, recently out to eat, which isn't a surprise. Um, how, many, how many moms just don't like cooking sometimes after work? How many dads... Don't like cooking? How many dads try to cook sometimes? And then the moms are like, nice try. <laughs> right? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. So we were out recently <clears throat> eating at a, a local authentic Mexican place. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And so as we were there, um, we were talking to the um, waitress. And somehow, I don't know how, how it happens but God used a conversation of COVID to bring about an opportunity to invite somebody to church. I thought, well, that's been redeemed, <laughs> right? And so, so the point is, if you can't remember the last time you invited somebody to church, then are we really about seeking and saving the lost? And so this person, I invited them, and I'm hoping that she shows up. But what I'll tell you is we are responsible to sow seed we're responsible, responsible to water the seed if someone else has sowed it. We're responsible to harvest when the harvest is ready. But we can't tell where it is. We're just called to be obedient. Yes? There's two people that get that. I like that. It's the rest of you. Are you with me? So he sent them out to preach the gospel. Why? Because he's about seeking and saving the lost. Look at the, the apostle Paul said in Romans, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. God is still saying, I'm still about seeking and saving the lost. The apostle Paul said, hey, the mission hasn't changed but how can they hear if no one goes to tell them? How can they hear if no one's preaching the word? So we, as a church, we need to be about our father's business in the region that we live in, but we can't be closed-minded to the rest of the global church. We've got to continue to help. When we reach out and we help in different nations, different states, when we start assisting other ministries, what we're saying is we can't put boots on the ground, but we will assist you to be about the father's business where you are. And that's what a mission-minded church is. It says, uh, Jesus, uh, he said, uh, in Luke 10, Jesus appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. What are we saying? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, continue to be about the Father's business wherever you are and continue to assist those that you'll never, where you'll never be, maybe. Hello? Are you getting this? And so for, for a few weeks, I've been talking to you about the good we were able to do at the border where Pakistan and Afghanistan meet. So many of the refugees have crossed the border into Pakistan. They're living under open skies. They have nothing. But guess what? We've got a ministry connection in Pakistan, Pastor Sammy, who said, hey, we want to do good, but we don't have resource. And we said, you know what? And us, have, us and a few churches in, in America decided to partner together to send thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to flood that area. Area so that they could be the hands and feet of Christ, that they could show love to these refugees that have nothing. And so I finally got the pictures for you. We're going to show you a few of them. This is them starting to put together all of the care packages. Let's go to the next one. So right here in the middle, this is Pastor Sammy right in the middle as he's beginning to distribute uh, at, the, at the border. Let's go to the next one. These are some of the mothers being able to get the food for their families and their kids. Let's go to the next one. Oh, these are some of the kids that are getting to open the bags. Come on, let's go to the next one. Smiles. Thank you, Metro Church. Thank you for being about God's business. Let's go to the next one. Oh, come on now. How cute is that? Look at smiles and filling bellies. Church, this is what the church is. It's not just about preaching on Sunday. It's about loving on Monday. It's about being about the Father's business. Thank you. 
Thank you. We've got to be about the Father's business. How beautiful are the hands and feet that carry the message of the gospel? Well, the message of the gospel is not just the word. It's also deed. The church has to be mission-minded. Are you getting this? We cannot miss this point. Whether it's in our own backyard or assisting missionaries and ministries around the world to do the same, that is the mission of God's church. So, Church, lever, church, let's never miss the point of mercy and grace we have received to be able to give that out. You receiving this? Yeah. Number four is their heartfelt worship. We're still talking about seven traits to identify a healthy church. Is their heartfelt worship, not just a show, but substance behind the song. You know, I know a lot of people, they... They're thrown off by things like all these lights that we have back here. And they say, oh, that's just distraction. Well, I worship with my eyes closed as much as I can, right? The same way that the Bible teaches to pray with your eyes closed. Not because you're more holy, just because you have less distraction. My little kids, uh, as, as we're praying before we go to bed, um, you know, my, my youngest, she's just kind of like talking and looking around. And then she'll forget what she's talking about. And I'm like, that's why we close our eyes. That's why we close our eyes. Right? Not because you're more holy, but you can finish your sentence. <laughs> right? Right? And so, so it's really about a heartfelt worship. There's got to be substance behind the song. And, and for people that have problems with this, I said, well, they had problems when they put stained glass into the churches all those hundreds of years ago. This is just modern day stained glass. It's just bringing about interest. You know what it's doing? It's capturing the next generation's attention long enough to hear the gospel. That's what it's doing. And so a lot of parents that aren't interested in this, I'm saying you should be interested in this for the sake of your kids and your kids' kids. Because I need their attention long enough so they can hear the name of Jesus a few times. Hello? Okay. So it's not just a show. I'm not looking just for energy when it comes to worship, but joy and passion that stirs the soul. I tell our team all the time, look at all you're doing up here is trying to get people excited about the reason you're excited to worship God because God is good. I said, you are the best deflector ever because as they send their attention to you, you should look like you don't care about them and you're deflecting it all upwards. Everything's got to be about God. But man, if I'm like, holy, holy, Holy is the Lamb of God. Guess what you're doing? Where's the nearest exit? You're not thinking about how good God is. You're thinking about how bad that person sinks. You're thinking about how much they clearly don't care about the Jesus that they're trying to tell you to worship. Everything matters, church. But there needs to be substance behind the song. Is there heartfelt worship? Jeremiah says, sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. We've got reason to worship God. A church that considers what God, that God saved them and what he saved them from, they're going to worship so maybe it would be a good idea not to keep all your old pictures to remember the, those times of sin. Because how many know sin's fun? Is he allowed to say that? The devil knows how to get you interested. But it's fun for a moment. There's an eternity of fun waiting if we would just be more like Jesus. Hello? But the, so, so I'm not telling you to hold on to stuff just to remember the fun. I'm saying remember where you came from so you don't end up back there again. When you remember where you came from and what God has already done in your life, you can't help but worship him. You're like, are you kidding me? Look at the world I live in and somehow you've redeemed this. I'm not worthy, but I will praise you and I will accept it. Yes? And so a church that considers what God saved them from will worship. Look at Exodus 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or on the waters below. You shall not bow to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am what? A jealous God. He wants your prayers. He wants your praise. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to see you raise up holy hands without wrath or doubt. He's jealous for your attention in the same way that you're jealous for his when you're in trouble. God, I know I worshiped with my hands in my pockets and I didn't actually sing today, but I could really use your help. Could I have your attention even though I don't give you mine? I'm thankful God is better than we are. I'm thankful that he is good. 
But I'm thankful for the power that comes in preaching the gospel and the transformation and the renewing of mind that can happen if we would just allow the Holy Spirit to convict. Somebody says, oh, that church is so judgy. No, the Holy Spirit was convicting you and you felt it because someone actually preached something convicting with a smile. (laughs) Churches filled with people that aren't worshiping signal a culture that hasn't taught people to count their blessings. Or it isn't teaching God's commands in Psalms 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Not humdrum songs that people just are like, wow, that was depressing. Can we be done? (laughs) Joyful songs. Why? If you're not in joy, you can still have peace and be in his joy. Even if you're not in a world of joy, you can still carry. Because how many know the source is within, not coming from something outside? Right? And so uh, it goes on to say, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God, I want your faithfulness. Well, then worship me for what I've already been faithful for. So many people say, no, I totally believe in God. I, you know, I believe in God, but I'm not into that whole worship thing. The scripture says you don't have a choice. It said shout. Church, will you shout? Church, will you shout? Will you get your dancing feet on? Will you rejoice? Do you know rejoicing means jumping and spinning in circles? Ain't none of you jumping and spinning in circles, but the dark, it commands it. And other people are like, that's weird. <laughs> not about that life. I'm just going to teach the word of God and let the Holy Spirit bring about change in your worlds. I'm having more fun than you are. (laughs) Number five, is there faith-filled prayer? Is there faith-filled prayer? Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Interesting enough, that was what our first church's name was, was the house of prayer go all the way back to 85. We were a church plant out of an amazing church that still is amazing and thriving in Richmond, Virginia. And uh, our founding pastors were the associate pastors that helped found the church uh, in Virginia called the House of Prayer. And we came out and were called the House of Prayer. And then um, through time changes and shifts, we have now obviously Metro Church. And people say, what's that about? Well, we used to be Metro West Christian Life Center. People would say, what's a Christian Life Center? We'd say a church. They go, oh, I'll just call it that. Okay. Well, for a long time, no one would like the word church either because of what happened here locally through the church. And so we went from Metro West to just Metro and from Christian Life Center to just church. We're Metro Church. You never even knew it. Now you do. I'll let you in sometimes. But look at we're called to be a house of prayer for all nations. Second Chronicles tells us this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will hear, uh, heal their land. That's a lot of wills. If we will pray, God will do a lot of things. That's a lot of wills. You go back. If we do something, he will do a bunch of other things. So look at, we can't make God do anything. But we got to pray and believe he will do anything at any time. Did you get that? What did I just say? I simply said, we can't make God do anything. We're not twisting his arm, but he's already said yes and amen to the promises. We can believe for it, but we've got to believe he can do anything at any time. And we pray like that because we see it. How many people are thankful that miracles are still happening today? How many people are thankful that we can still see God move? So I'm not just saying we're just praying on a Sunday to get through prayer. No, we need to see faith-filled prayer where God is doing something. Even when the service is over, people come to the front to receive faith-filled prayer from the elders who will anoint them with oil, which is scriptural. I don't know about that. Well, if it's in the scripture, I'm going to go for it. There needs to be faith-filled prayer. I know, I'm preaching so much you can't even clap. It's fine. I I got time. So 1 Thessalonians tells this, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Don't just pray the same prayer every day. Why don't you challenge yourself not to open the prayer the same way you always open the prayer? How about you end the prayer differently? 
Because it's easy for us to get into nursery rhyme prayers to say we prayed. But what's really on your hearts? What are you really longing for? How do you need God to move in your world? How do you need to be changed to assist that person who has great need? We need to really be considering and praying like God can change things because he can and will if we will. Yes? 1 John 5, 15, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked for. That's some serious faith. Yes? Does it mean if you don't get it, you lose faith in all things? No, it means that, see, God can say, he's got a yes and a no, but he's also got a slow and a grow. So maybe the thing you're praying for isn't even a bad thing. It's just you're not ready. Slow down. If you had that now, it would overcome you and you would fall. If that person came into your world, he would pull you away from the church rather than you having an anchor right now. Because right now you're in a dependent, needy place and you would reach for the person you can see rather than the unseen. That was for somebody. That was for somebody. Just letting you know. Romans 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. We need to be faithful in prayer. And we need to pray faith-filled prayers. You got this, church? Hmm. Number six, are they generationally focused? We're talking about seven traits of a healthy church. Are they generationally focused? Does the church have a commitment to the next generation? Can you see it in their spaces, in the places of the church? When you walk down the hallway, are there places because they have envisioned your next generation being taught in the house? Is there investment there? Generationally focused. Do the kids enjoy being there? Because it's one thing to have a space, but to have people that don't care about kids being with the kids. Now, let me tell you, parents, if your child is new to the kids' ministry, it's going to take a few weeks for them to get used to it as if you were dropping them to daycare. It's going to take time. Hang with me, Gabby. It's going to be a while. I ain't done yet. <laughs> so listen, if you don't set your child up for success by continuing to put the boundaries of, no, this is a healthier place for you than sitting with me where you're not going to get anything, this is a healthier place for you. If you don't continue to double down on that, you're not allowing them to grow in a space that's going to grow them. So generationally focused, you've got to think past lunch for your own family too. We've got to begin to help our kids continue to grow in the things of God in a way, in a place they can understand with the, the thought nuggets that they can grab onto. God is love, and I know what love is because my mom loves me. My dad loves me, so God must love me the same way. Yes? And so... Do the kids enjoy being there? Promises to you and to your children. Remember we sing this, this uh, direct scripture, this song that says, uh, bless us, keep us, let your face shine upon us, be faithful, grateful for us. I don't know why I can't think of scripture in the moment. You, it's funny, we have this game where uh, some people, I'm like, oh, that's scripture, and then they tell it to me. I'm like, I'm glad I've told you that scripture 18 times so you could actually quote it to me directly. So listen, we actually pray we sing, we believe for the blessing over generation to generation because the scripture talks about generation to generation. Is the church thinking generation to generation? Psalm 78, we will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be unborn, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Look, at if you're raising a child in a church where there's nothing for them, maybe it's because you prefer the style of the church, but there's nothing for them, then you know they're, you're choosing a style over a substance for your family. When your kids grow up, don't be surprised when church isn't for them because you never made it for them. You made it about you the whole time. You know, the amount of times I've sat down and people say, yeah, I, I love the teaching here. I love what God's doing here, but that music is just not for me. And I said, well, it's not always designed to be for you because your kids really like it. We've got to capture that next generation. We've got to help them see God's goodness. The thing that I learned from a very early age was watching our founding pastor give up his own desires of what he would personally prefer in the church, knowing it was going to be a benefit to the next generation.
the amount of square footage they paid for back in the early days for us to have our own youth center. We had thousands of square feet just for young, uh, youth and young adult space. The amount of square footage they invested in the kids' ministry. The amount, we were always thinking of the next generation, and a healthy church does that. When the church doesn't actively reach the next generation, we willfully lose them. Does the church have appropriate ministries for different ages? And I understand early churches, pioneering days. If you feel, feel called to do that with a pioneering church, you know what you're going to have to do, and you know that there's going to be a grace for that. But if you've got an established family and you don't feel called to, to, to be involved in a pioneering church, then you need to find a healthy church that's healthy for every generation. Yes? yes. Nehemiah 13, it says, Moreover, in those days I saw men of Judah, God's people, who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, what would have been considered the language of the world at the time, right? Or the language of the other peoples and did not know how to speak the language of Judah, which would have been considered God's language. They gave up the ability to continue to pass to the next generation how to speak God's language how to understand God's language. They allowed culture to just change who they were. Church, we have to be about the next generation if we're going to reach them. I'm thankful we're a part of a church that that is true. Yes? Over time, they let you, over time, they let the culture overtake their call to be set apart. That's what happened there. It doesn't take long for the world to brainwash your kids. They won't even know it's happening. But you can tell through how they speak. Is it full of faith? Is it God revering? Or does it sound like Ashdod, the language of the world? The amount of people that insinuate Pastor Julie and I are lucky to have good kids, they didn't come that way. <laughs> oh, well, you just don't have strong willed children. You don't know my youngest. No, we raised them up and we put hard boundaries. But we put hard boundaries in love, not creating rebellion. We didn't say, because I said so. We helped them understand why. Because the minute you say, because I said so, you create the Garden of Eden's rebellion against it. Hello. Stop thinking you're the only one who has strong-willed, opinionated kids. Pair up. Don't allow them to lose the language of Judah. And number seven, because I'm out of time. Do they have a healthy leadership model? When you're looking into that church, is that church for me? Do they have a healthy leadership model? The Apostle Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I have passed them on to you. See, you can't stay part of a church where you don't trust the leadership. Is there a healthy leadership model? Do I respect those in leadership here? wherever you are, what I want to take their advice based on the fruit I can see in their lives. How is their family life? Are they, authentic, are they authentic to their conviction? How are their kids outside of church? And I know this, look, at, I'm, I'm just trying to simply say, look, we're not perfect, but the reality is we're called to raise families, the leadership here. We don't just put anyone in charge of ministries. We pray about it. We look at their life. Are they somebody that our, our people could follow? We need to make sure there's a healthy model of leadership so people will follow. Now look, there needs to be extra doses of grace because we're all human, right? But is it healthy? There will never be perfection, but is there growth and accountability? First Timothy, I gotta read fast. Here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him and he must do so in a manner are worthy of full respects. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? And it goes on to talk about he must not be a recent convert or he may be conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. 
meaning the devil has traps, right? In the same way, deacons, who are the deacons? These are the board of elders. These are the people that are overseeing the church at different levels, right? It says, in the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household. There are levels of expectations to lead in a church. When you walk into a church, do you see a healthy leadership model that you can follow? Not just whether you like the paint on the walls or you think the lights are cool. Are they preaching the word of God? Are they Christ-centered? Is there substance in the worship? Do they have faith-filled prayer? Are they thinking outside of the four walls being mission-minded? And can you lead? Can you follow the leader? Here's a question. Do I believe they hear from God? Because you're going to need to believe they hear from God if you thought you heard from God. And you go and say, hey, I really believe God's calling me to do X, Y, and Z. You're hoping that you believe they hear from God so they can go pray about it and come back and tell you what they feel God's saying too. Hello? Or am I in this church just because my family has been here for generations even though it's no longer healthy? It once was one of these things, but it's no longer that. I'm just not moving, but I need to for the sake of my next generation. This is hard teaching church, but I want to see healthy churches. I want to see healthy people who have to come and be a part of healthy churches. So these are important ways to identify a healthy church home. Do you get a church? So again, if you can't find one like that near you, stay connected online. We're happy to be able to continue to bring this to you. But listen, the Bible says that we need to be connected, that we need to be planted in the house of God. I'll finish with Psalm 92. It says, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree and they will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green. Did you receive the message, church? Come on, let's stay planted. Let's stay connected to a healthy church home. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes real quick? I just want to close in prayer today. I don't know who you are, what's going on in your life. Maybe I, maybe this is your first time being here. Maybe you've, you just jumped on a stream because someone shared it. Look at God loves you. He loves you so much. He sent his only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for you. Why did he have to? Because Romans tells us that for the wages of sin is death. And it also tells us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean for me? What it means is that I'm a sinner and I need saving. That's what the world is dealing with right now. We need saving. And Jesus is the only one who came from the Father, who robed himself in flesh live the perfect life to inevitably be the perfect sacrifice to pay the ransom for all of us. He paid our debt. He covered our sin, our bill. And I want to tell you, God loves you so much, he wants to welcome you into his family. Because just because Jesus died doesn't mean he died for you unless you accept it for yourself. He died thinking of you, but have you accepted him into your hearts? Have you said, God, I want to make a place and a space for you. I want you to become my savior. I want you to be in my life. I'm going to need a lot of help, but I need you. Right now, I can help lead you in a prayer to know that you're going to experience God's grace and mercy, his forgiveness, and be counted as part of his family, a son or a daughter in his kingdom. How do I know that? Because God's word has no error and he's promised it to us. If you're here today and you're saying, Pastor Chad, include me in that prayer. Maybe you've stepped away. Maybe like the prodigal, you've walked away from God and you know you need to get right with him again. Maybe this is the very, very first time you have ever been in church, but you know, man, something is happening on the inside. God is doing something and I want to receive this. Anything that would tell you otherwise isn't from God. God is reaching out to you right now.
With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here, if you're at home right now and you're saying, Pastor Chad, include me in that prayer, just quickly slip up your hand while no one else is looking around. I see that hand, that hand, that hand. Come on, I see that hand right there. Come on. Well, don't leave yet if that's you. Don't leave yet. Listen, if this is you and you're saying yes to Jesus, I want to lead you in a prayer right where you are. Come on, church. Will we say this together? Let's say, God, I thank you that you love me so much. You sent your only son to die for me and even though I don't deserve it I accept it Jesus come into my heart Father forgive me Holy Spirit help me to live this life you created me for I'm going to need a lot of help but today I give you my life and until the day you return I will do all I can to fulfill this purpose on my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, can we give a huge hand to all those that made that decision? Yes, hey, how exciting it is. Look, if you made that decision, we as a church wanna come alongside you and do more than clap. We wanna help you on this faith journey. There's little books in front of you in the seat back. There's a video that's gonna tell you a little bit more, but just know we need each other. God created the church. No Lone Ranger Christians out there. He created the church so that we can grow and develop together and run the race together. Did you receive the word, church? <laughs> know that I love you. I'm praying for you, and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for being with us today. We hope you were encouraged by that powerful message. If you made that decision for the first time, we just want to say congratulations. Here are some ways we can help. First, email us at info at metrochurch.tv letting us know you made that decision. We'll send you this free book called What on Earth Am I Here For? which talks about the purpose that God has for your life. If you're joining us in person, this booklet is also available in the seat back in front of you. Our church offices will also reach out regarding our dive-in class, which is a four-week series offered here at Metro Church. If you missed the beginning of this service and would still like to participate in giving, you can do so through the Metro Church app or on our website. We will also have generosity boxes available by the exit doors. For those of you joining us for the first time, don't forget to pick up your blue gift bag on the way out. As always, if you need prayer for anything, make sure to email info at metrochurch.tv. We'd love to pray and believe with you. Thank you again for being with us today. We love you, Metro Church, and we cannot wait to see you next week.